Today we're going to be talking about act potency, causal powers, natural laws, and the contemporary distinction between categorical and dispositional properties. And this is going to conclude the first chapter of uh, Edward Fazer's book, Scholastic Metaphysics, a Contemporary Introduction. And he, uh, today we're really going to be getting into the way in which Fazer relates the medieval tradition of scholasticism with contemporary uh, Anglo-American analytic philosophy. Now, before we get into this, we need to say something to set up the problematic that concerns um, contemporary analytic metaphysics, because it's re in relationship to this problematic that Phaser is largely um, going to be developing the notions of the scholastic theory of causation and the causal powers and how act and potency uh, figure into that. And so it's useful for us to start with uh, a summary statement of the um, the basic scholastic account of causation. And that goes as follows. On the scholastic account of causation, causation is the exercise of intrinsic powers belonging to the essence of a thing, and therefore there is necessity in the cause-effect connection. So I've underlined the key uh, ideas here, the idea that causation involves intrinsic powers belonging to essence and resulting in a necessary connection between cause and effect. Now, this necessary connection, um, we shouldn't be uh, misled into thinking this means that there's always necessarily got to be some kind of uh, invariant succession of events, uh, but we'll get into that later on to, to explain the sense of necessity that's involved here. But it's key that for the scholastics, it's related to the uh, essential character of certain powers. Okay, so um, this view, which dominated the Middle Ages, gradually historically became eroded uh, it became eroded in the later Middle Ages <clears throat> and then in the early modern period until finally uh, it was completely undone by the uh, great 18th century Scottish philosopher David Hume, who um, really uh, in many ways set the agenda for analytic philosophy in the uh, 20th and continuing on into the uh, 21st century. So it's really Hume that uh, Phaser is taking on more than anyone else. And in a second, I will give a comparative summary of Hume's perspective on causation, um, comparing it to the scholastic conception. But first, just very briefly, um, a few words about the uh, developments that led to um, this new Humean conception of causation. So. The basis of this, and I'm just, of course, um, recapitulating the story that Phaser tells, which is um, fairly widely known. The basis of this was uh, William of Ockham and his extreme theological voluntarism. Theological voluntarism is the view that God's will is absolute. God's will is absolute. It's best known probably in the context of ethical theory, where it is um, usually described as the view that the good and the right is just whatever God wills it to be, whatever God wills it to be. But in this context, um, it's a more general theory. It's the theory that God can will anything to be anything. And so there, are, there is no necessity, certainly, um, apart from God's will, from God's volition, which is just the Latin, uh, Latinized word for will. Now, this led to a skepticism about universals. Um, the idea is that there aren't the universals, I mean, Plato's forms would be one version of understanding these universals uh, that makes this pretty clear. There are no universals that just exist as sort of self-standing realities that have their own intrinsic features and in nature. Everything is subject to God. And so the consequence of this for causation is that God can break the causal connections between things. 
that things at the ultimate metaphysical level, the basic metaphysical level, are, to use Hume's famous phrase, loose and separate, loose and separate. I mean, if it is the case that uh, water boils when it's put over a flame, that does not have anything to do with the intrinsic character, intrinsic powers of flame and water on the human understanding, but rather it just has to do with the fact that um, God put them together to extend this to Occam's idea. Okay, so that began to develop this idea, and some people have interpreted Occam as being a kind of proto humean whether that is the case or not, or this other figure, um, Nicholas of uh, Atricor. Uh, we don't need to get into those historical questions. The point is just that, um, that I want to emphasize here is that it was really a theological idea that ultimately undermined the Aristotelian notion of causation and led also to the development, as we'll see next, of an idea of laws of nature, our, our famous idea of a law of nature. Now, law is a concept that naturally has its place in the human realm, in the realm of human political life. We have laws. These laws are instituted by an authority and enforced by an authority, or not enforced, as the case uh, often is these days. Laws are something that is um, instituted and therefore requires a law giver. So when we apply the concept of law to nature, this naturally suggests that there must be a law giver uh, in order for there to be true laws in nature. And of course, in the traditional scholastic understanding um, and in the early moderns who took this idea up, uh, the, the lawgiver would have to be God himself. Now, um, the theory that became known as occasionalism was developed in early modern philosophy. It was based on this idea that in themselves, things are indeed loose and separate. Uh, if there is some kind of necessary connection between flame and boiling water, it doesn't have anything to do with the intrinsic character of these objects, but rather what it has to do with is God's decrees, God's decrees. God has decreed it to be the case that when you put water on flame, um, it, it boils. And in fact, the, the strict occasionalist would say that in fact, it's not the flame that causes uh, water to boil, because after all, there's no intrinsic powers or properties in flame or water themselves. Rather, what's the case is that God causes um, the water to boil on the occasion of it being placed over a flame. Thus, you have occasionalism. So there's no real cause there in the things themselves of nature. These are just occasions for God, through his gracious will, to exercise his power, which, of course, he could restrict at any time. Um, a related version of this, although not the same, is uh, Leibniz's famous notion of pre-established harmony, that things don't actually causally interact, but rather God has just made it appear that way because um, he created a pre-established harmony among the perceptions of the various um, constituent substances of nature, on Leibniz's view, so that, it, so that everyone is basically synchronized, like um, two separate watches that um, always have this tell the same time because they were synchronized to do so. So God set it up beforehand for there to be this pre-established harmony. Again, there's no causal interaction between things. Now, um, Fazer calls this a, um, a top-down view of the relationship between causations and natural laws. In the traditional medieval view, traditional scholastic view uh, that existed before Occam, you had basically a bottom-up view. You have intrinsic powers, and these powers express themselves in certain um, regular necessary ways. And if you describe the ways in which they express themselves, you get um, laws of nature. And so you have the um, bottom level, so to speak, of objects uh, are what account for and give rise to, at the higher level, uh, the existence of laws of nature. Whereas in this uh, late medieval and early modern uh, view that developed, it's a top-down view rather than a bottom-up view. It's the top, God, is where the uh, causal um, power comes from. 
and at the bottom level of individual things, they're just there, you know, being subject to God's will or subject to some pre-established harmony. So God decrees the laws. And this naturally gives rise to a question. What happens when atheism comes along? Uh, once you've accepted this idea that there's no causal power in natural objects themselves, that their causal power is all due to God. Well, what happens is you get the perspective of David Hume essentially. And that's what we have here. So you see that for Hume, um, first of all, he believed that uh, the only sound theory of knowledge is in empiricism. And so um, in the context of this discussion, the terms empiricist and Humean, that's, you know, if you just add the, the A-N, um, at the end, you get a disciple of David Hume, or follower of David Hume's way of, of thinking about things, a Humean. So that's what we would, we would add there. But we'll take that off for now so as not to cause confusion. So David Hume, 18th century Scottish philosopher, um, was an empiricist, an empiricist, a person who holds to the theory of knowledge that says all of our knowledge, and indeed for him, all of the contents of our minds um, has to be ultimately traceable back to experience. Has to be traceable back to experience. So um, only what is impressed, that was Hume's word, impressions, only what is impressed on the um, senses is real. And this leads to one of the uh, Humean doctrines that must discuss in this chapter, namely that, um, that only the actual is real. Only the actual is real. Therefore, this is going to be, of course, a denial of potency or potentiality as a level of reality in between being and non-being, as we saw the Aristotelian scholastics hold. Um, okay, so none of these things, none of the things that the scholastics asserted, intrinsic power, essence, or necessary connections, are impressed on the senses. This is Hume's famous skepticism. He says, look, we, we can't trace any of these ideas back to anything that's a real mind-independent object that's impressed upon our, our senses. In other words, these are all going to be regarded as pseudo-concepts. I don't know if you can read that there, pseudo-concepts. They're figments of the overactive scholastic imagination, in other words. These are not real um, reflections of reality. So therefore, the causal relation cannot be accounted for in terms of intrinsic powers belonging to the essences of things. And therefore, we can't appeal to essences to underwrite the idea of there being a necessary connection between causes and effects. So then what do we have here? What we have, according to Hume, is just constant conjunction. So the causal relation is nothing beyond the constant conjunction of regular um, events, regular types of events, which are contingently related. So there's nothing beyond the causal connection uh, between flame, open flame, and boiling water, beyond the fact that we constantly observe that when we put water over, boiling, uh, over flame, it boils. And that's it. There's nothing else to the story of causation. And Hume said that we just observe this occurring um, you know, many times, and like Pavlov's dog, we just sort of become conditioned to expect it to happen. And that gives us a, a pseudo idea that there's actually a necessary connection there. But this is, this is a pseudo idea. There's, there's no ground for this um, in um, Hume's epistemology, his empiricism. Okay. Now, some people would say that um, Hume's position is basically a reductio ad absurdum of empiricism. It shows that if, if, if this is what empiricism leads to, then empiricism uh, is an unacceptable theory of knowledge. However, um, if, for various reasons that we can't go into here, um, empiricism has continued to uh, maintain its hold, especially uh, in the English-speaking world, but not only there, but especially in the English-speaking world. And so it's become the house philosophy, so to speak, of the um, English-speaking um, academy. Uh, and so Hume has been very influential for this 
reason, okay? So that's the picture, that's basically what happened. This view was replaced by this and gradually um, through a process in which the original scholastic um, outlook was gradually weakened over the, uh, the later centuries of the, of the medieval period and in the early modern period. All right. So the, um, the theory that Hume is uh, normally associated with is um, what Phaser refers to in the later part of this chapter as the regularity theory. The regularity theory. And what this means is just that uh, causation, so this is a theory of causation, the regularity theory of causation, it says that the causal relationship between uh, cause and effect, between A and B, is simply a regular connection between A and B. There is therefore no need to posit any powers or necessary connection. So the Humean or regularity theory is one that reduces the causal relationship to mere regularity. Okay, now there are a number of objections Stock objections, you might say. Uh, this, obviously, this has been around for a while, right? So um, objections have arisen to regularity theories. And here are um, some of them. One is um, asymmetry. Asymmetry meaning the asymmetry between causes and effects. So we understand that if A is the cause of B, then B is not and cannot be the cause of A. Um, and if that is the case, then um, can irregularity theory account for this asymmetry? Um, because after all, the cause and effect uh, have nothing intrinsic to them that says that A has to be the cause of B. Um, it could very well turn out to be the case that it's flipped the next time you experience it. And so um, this seems to be counterintuitive. It seems to, I mean, it, this makes the cause and effect too loose and disconnected. Now, one way of um, trying to possibly answer this problem is to say, well, you need to add a temporality condition. This was very important for uh, Immanuel Kant's um, version of causality, which was in terms of time. The view has to be that A has to temporally precede B, precede B in time. And that's how you account for asymmetry on a regularity theory. The cause is always has to temporarily precede, precede in time, precede in time rather. Um, but there's a problem with this too, that it seems like some causes and effects are simultaneous. So, um, you know, just think about anything that is holding up something else. Right now a table is holding up my laptop computer as I speak to you. Um, it's happening at the same time. There is no temporal relationship there. At least it's not plausible to think of it as constantly being renewed every instant, right? That the table is, is um, preceding um, the holding over the computer. So the temporal conclusion um, condition rather is not something that seems like it's going to avoid the conclusion that this uh, asymmetry condition is violated. A second example is uh, what we might call um, separating out the causes from concomitants. And I'm just going to put this as um, causes not concomitants. Causes not concomitants. That is to say, causes are not concomitants. So, uh, you know, his example is when you th uh, throw a stone into a pond, say, um, and some distance away from where the stone landed, let's say there's a leaf, um, and say there's always leaves in this pond, you will find a regular succession of ripples moving the leaf, right? But you will also find a concomitant. You will hear a splash, 
and then you know a second later you'll see the leaf move. Now the ripples intuitively are the cause of the leaf moving. The splash is not. But the regularity theory has no way of distinguishing between the two. Uh, because all it says, this is even, of course, if we add a temporality condition, uh, because all the regularity theory says is there has to be a regular succession of cause and effect. And indeed, the splash is followed by the leaf moving. But the splash isn't causing the leaf to move. So that's a second problem. Third is that regularity obtains without connection in a given case, or can obtain without connection. This is sort of related. You can't have regularity without connection. Um, so he takes the example of a second stone. You throw two stones. Um, and, you know, one of them is causing the uh, leaf to move, but the other one is not causing the leaf to move. Um, but you might say that, um, well, the regular connection here is throw the stone and the leaf moves. And that's true. That is the regular connection. And um, that obtains with regard to the first stone and the second stone equally. But in this example, both of them are not the causes. Um, so how do you account for, for which one is the cause? Now you can see in all these examples how a power theory can easily uh, account for this. I mean, in this example, the power theory would say, well, it's the power of the one stone that actually accounts for why the leaf moved and not the power of the other stone. But that's not what the regularity theory um, says. It just says that there's a regularity between what we observe, right? This is the thoroughgoing empiricist theory. And so it can't posit anything about having to do with the intrinsic powers of things. Okay, so those are the three uh, objections, asymmetry, causes or not concomitants, and that you can have regularity um, without connection. Now, in response to this, we get a more sophisticated development of the regularity theory, and this is the counterfactual theory, and this is, um, oops, attributed to David Lewis, a 20th century uh, Princeton professor, American professor, uh, another David, and you see the description of what the counterfactual theory says on the top of uh, 55. So the counterfactual theory is going to be stated in terms of counterfactuals. A counterfactual statement is a statement about what would be the case under such and such circumstances. Okay, so um, if I were to, uh, you know, um, walk to the store today, I would get some exercise. But as it turns out, I'm not going to, so therefore I'm not going to get any exercise. Uh, so it, it's, it's counter to the facts. That's the idea. So here's the way he describes this on page 55, right at the top. So here are the three statements. First is, these are three conditions that have to obtain in order to have a cause-effect relationship. That's what this is describing, the theory is describing. So it's, if A had not occurred, B would not have occurred. That's this describes the necessary condition. If A had occurred, B would have occurred, describing the sufficient condition. And then three, both A and B are, uh, both occurred. So that's the counterfactual account of causation. If all those three things are correct, then you have a causal relationship. Notice that this is still in terms of regularities, but it's no longer in terms of actual factual regularities, but rather counterfactual regularities. Uh, but it still, in a sense, is, is within the realm of Hume's view that only the actual is real, because these statements are statements that one imagines could be scientifically tested. And that's the whole point. You want to preserve this empiricism of the theory of causation. And so we're stating it now, not in terms of what's just been observed in a kind of casual way, but what could be observed, what could be tested. 
So it's in principle verifiable. Now this view does indeed solve the three objections that we went over earlier, uh, because it, first of all, captures the asymmetry insofar as in this example, B depends on A, but not A on B. Second, it would capture the fact that it was the ripples and not the splash, because the, the, it's imagining a counterfactual situation in which the ripples did not occur. And in that case, you would say, okay, then the leaf would not move. But had the splash not occurred, the leaf still would have moved. So it's able to account for that difference between the ripples and the splash in the second objection. And then it's in a similar way, it captures the fact that the leaf would have moved had the second stone not been thrown. Um, so it appears that at least with regard to the stock objections to the regularity theory, you do have an improvement um, if you adopt this uh, counterfactual theory of David Lewis. And this is still broadly Humean um, because it says causal facts are to be reduced to actualities, to facts about what happens, together with facts about fundamental laws. And that's the sort of the added part. So um, it includes this, this idea that there are these fundamental laws, laws of nature, and therefore it's going to have to have some kind of you know, understanding of what laws of nature amount to. And that's going to be ultimately rooted in, in regularities of some kind. Secondly, on the counterfactual theory, once again, there's no intrinsic or necessary connection between objects and events. If you go back over those three statements, that constitute the theory, there's no, there's no need for us to suppose, um, according to this theory, that there's any intrinsic or necessary connection between objects and events. All there has to be is just this conditional relationship. If one happens, the other happens, but it's not a, it's not a logical necessity that that's the case. It just has to be de facto the case, and it could just be a brute fact. Okay. Well, there are still problems, though, with the counterfactual approach that he goes through. And one of these is the problem of Fink's. Fink's. F-I-N-K. Fink's. So um, in this example uh, that Facer goes through, uh, the causal analysis that says, and here's the analysis, if a live wire was touched by a conductor, then electrical current flows from the wire to the conductor. So that's a causal analysis. That, that causal analysis is supposed to give, according to the counterfactual theory, necessary conditions for a wire being live. It says counterfactually, if a live wire is touched by a conductor, then electrical current flows from the wire to the conductor. However, imagine that there's a device called an, an, an electrofink. Electrofink. And this electrofink this is a thought experiment. This is a device that renders a live wire dead when it's touched by a conductor. And it renders a dead wire alive. So on this example, the counterfactual analysis actually would fail to give necessary and sufficient conditions for a wire being live. Because the wire is live, but um, According to the counterfactual, counterfactual causal analysis, it registers as dead, and vice versa. When it's dead, it registers as live. So um, how is Lewis going to deal with this? Well, in response to this uh, objection, he gave, gave the uh, reformed conditional analysis. This is on page 57, and it's a little bit involved, so you want to look at this. It's the reformed conditional analysis says, Something X is disposed at time T to give response R to stimulus F if for some intrinsic property that B, intrinsic property B that X has at T, um, for some time T prime after T, if X were to undergo stimulus S at time T and retain property B until T prime, S and X's having of B would jointly be an X complete cause of X's giving response Y. All right, so that's the, the rigorous formulation of his response. But basically the idea is that there would be some 
however brief, however minuscule, some time lapse between when the um, the live wire uh, touched the um, conductor and the electro fink went into action, so to speak, um, and rendered it dead. And likewise, the dead wire touching the conductor and the electro fink uh, rendering it alive. And so that analysis would, that's why the time T is in there because the, it's, it's meant to incorporate the idea that, okay, you can give this counterfactual analysis as long as you include the idea that, um, you know, this particular wire would be live if um, we an analyzed it before the moment in which it was, uh, as it were, neutralized by the electro fink. Now, this, of course, renders the uh, counterfactual analysis less elegant and pretty, right? Because it's, now it's got this Rube Goldberg kind of um, construct to deal with these sorts of cases, but that's analytic philosophy, folks. But the worst problem is not, is not just that it um, becomes less clean, but it also cannot deal with other issues. And one of them is um, the issue of antidotes. And this is a very kind of intuitively clear idea, or masks, which is a little bit harder. Second objection is the antidotes or masks objection. So um, so in antidote, so you're, you're talking about, um, let's say, a poison that will, let's say, kill someone or harm them in some way. Um, it has, you know, in the scholastic sense, it has the power to kill or the power to harm. But if a person takes a certain antidote, it doesn't have that effect. And the problem is that the counterfactual analysis um, is only concerned with the relationship between the cause and effect, and it ignores all of the other background conditions, the in overall environment or context, which would include things like, hey, does that person have, has they take, have they taken an antidote to this thing? And so it gives the wrong um, understanding of causation here, because it, it would treat the uh, poison as if it didn't have the um, uh, ability to cause death. Um, but in fact, it does. You know, the scholastic would say it has the power to cause death, but the counterfactual analysis is unable to capture that because it's just going on regularities. And so, you know, if everyone has the antidote, the causal analysis would say that this doesn't have the power to cause death, but that's just obviously false. Another one is masking. So there are powers that in operation mask the operation of other powers. And this is a great colorful example. He says the power of King Midas, you know, King Midas, who, when he touched things, they turned to gold. And so Phaser says, now King Midas has the power to, um, to nourish himself. You know, just like you have the power to nourish yourself, go buy, um, you know, um, a uh, falafel pita or something and have lunch. That's for you um, vegetarians out there. Uh, but if King Midas decides he's going to buy a falafel pita, what happens? It turns to gold, right? And he, he's, he doesn't, he's not able to nourish himself. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have the power to nourish himself. What it means is that that power is masked by this other power. And this isn't just something for, you know, fantasy examples. Um, he uses uh, some examples from science, too, that show that, you know, their, their counterfactual analysis can capture powers that operate continuously and unconditionally in nature. Like, for example, the rest mass of things. Things that are acted upon by other forces so that their um, the gravitational force is essentially masked. That would be the example of something, a real example from nature that this counterfactual analysis can, uh, can account for. So thinks and the, um, the masks are two problems here. Um, now, here's one respect in which we can see the, the scholastic view that powers have to be distinct from their manifestations has a real advantage because, uh, you know, we obviously... Uh, observe this all the time, and we know intuitively it's true, but for the counterfactual approach, there always has to be some observable test situation in which the manifestation occurs. 
And that's not always the case. So use the example of a nuclear reactor who has the power to cause an, expo an explosion, or that has the power to cause an explosion. Um, you know, the efficacy of the safety devices is tested not by observing an explosion, but by observing that there is, isn't an explosion. And it's a sort of negative. We, we observe its power, so to speak, to prevent an explosion. We test it in that way, not by actually observing the explosion. Okay. So those are some uh, examples that suggest the way in which the power uh, approach is superior. Um, another final thing is that uh, some powers don't survive their manifestations and some do. So uh, if you think about solubility, um, you know, when something is dissolved in water, it loses its power of solubility. Uh, the power to generate flame, there are some things that retain the power to generate flame, a burner or whatever, but then there are other things like matches that don't retain their power, the power to generate flame. And that's another thing that it seems like a, a kind of distinction that the, the counterfactual approach um, has difficulty uh, accounting for, or it doesn't account for as, as neatly as the, the powers approach. Okay, so another um, pair of concepts here. Uh, and this brings us back to this distinction I alluded to earlier between there being a necessary connection between cause and effect, which is intuitively is the case, and the idea of invariance. In a regularity theory or a counterfactual theory, there's going to be a tendency to want to analyze um, regularity in terms of invariance. We see this invariant succession every time, without exception, invariably. Um, when I do X, I get Y result. But of course, in the real world, that's not always the case. Um, oftentimes, there are cause and effect relationships that don't have this invariant character. You know, so, you know, and sometimes, um, let's say, uh, there's a problem with uh, cars running into houses and property and um, uh, lamp posts and things on uh, lead and coal here in Albuquerque. Uh, someone thought it was a good idea to basically run an interstate through a residential neighborhood without wide uh, shoulders. So often this happens. You know, sometimes these... Um, Cars, let's say, will, when they run into a pole, will knock it down. Other times, they won't. Um, and because it's not invariant, doesn't mean that the car wasn't actually the cause of the knocking down of the pole. What it suggests is that there are different um, factors involved. And so Powers can explain what he calls the polygenic and pleiotropic character of effects. Sorry, the, the polygenic character of causes, rather. Let me try that again. Third time is the term. The polygenic character of effects and the pleiotropic character of causes. So this refers to the fact that um, effects arise from many causes acting in tandem. From many causes acting in tandem. So, you know, the, the light pole is knocked down in one instance because it was hit three times before, and then, the, you know, this fourth time, it's weakened enough that it goes down. And so it wasn't just the car in that instance that caused it to knock down, strictly speaking, but there are a number of things, right? Um, and then we've got the pleiotropic character of causes. So they're acting as vectors making uh, contributions to many types of effect. So you think about the, um, you know, the way in which one cause can perform all kinds of different, different effects. Uh, you know, you have a flame, what are the different things that a flame can do? You know, you can list them all day, right? It's not just that there's one effect that a flame uh, performs, it can 
It can melt ice, it can boil water, etc., 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 etc. Right? It can cause certain chemical reactions, um, and so on. So they, they, it acts as this is a, a metaphor from physics, right? You know that a vector of force can adjust the overall effect of things. Um, you know, this is why you know if you're a, a sniper or whatever, you know, you might have to aim and you're far enough, or you might have to aim slightly above your target to a certain degree in order to be able to actually hit the target and so on. Right? Because of the effect of gravity and so forth. So and wind resistance and these sorts of things. Okay. So the, the problem with the Humean analysis of causation is that the regularity and counterfactual dependence that they focus on are consequences of causal relationships. Um, rather than being constitutive of causal relationships. I'll say that again, that the regularity and counterfactual dependence they focus on are consequences of causal relationships rather than being constitutive of causal relationships. It's easier to see here in terms of powers that it's the power of the car, or the flame, or the bullet, or whatever you're talking about, in combination with other powers in other objects that leads overall to the effect. And it may be that if you hold enough of those things constant, that you do observe a kind of regularity. I mean, when you boil water, um, you know, you're holding a lot of things constant. You know, you're holding the um, air pressure, the uh, degree of um, energy that's being put into the flame through the gas burner or whatever, uh, the temperature of the water. I mean, all these things, you're, you're putting them, you're keeping them constant, so you observe a regularity. But really what's underlying this is the, is the power of the various factors involved. And their, their, the pleogenic character of the effect and the, sorry, the polygenic character of the effect and the pleotropic character of the causes. Uh, then finally, the, again, as we said, the, the, the regularity approach, the humane approach, uh, has a very difficult, if not impossible, time accounting for causation that doesn't involve two distinct and temporally successive events. Right? So um, one example, or two, the two examples he mentions are, imagine you have two books, right, that you're using to form a little um, arc uh, and, or arch in this way, and they're each causing the other to, to stand up, but they're not, of course, um, doing this in a way that can be described in terms of some regu regular succession of events. Similarly, the refrigerator holding up a magnet is another one that it's difficult to account for in terms of regularity. All right, so those are considerations from metaphysics that support the power ontology. Also, the ontology of powers fits better with the analytical method of science. Because science often posits forces that are never actually observed. Hypothetical powers that never actually occur. Um, you know, the law of electrostatic attraction, repulsion, which is hidden by gravitational attraction, uh, Newton's law of inertia, Kepler's uh, theory that, that planets move in ellipses. These are things that hold all things equal, but that's never actually the case. Th things never are actually equal. It's, these are sort of idealizations that are um, posited for, uh, indeed, empirical reasons, but not direct empirical reasons, by, because we don't have directly observe it. So the Humean account, in, in terms of observed regularities, uh, isn't fundamental to causation, but it's the result of um, what Nancy Cartwright, philosopher of science, calls nomological machines. Nomological, nomological is just a word for law, pertaining to law, right? Law, law machines, lawmaking machines. That is to say, relatively stable arrangements of components whose capacities or powers in combination give rise to relatively stable patterns of behavior. And again, this is sort of what I was referring to earlier when we, you know, in a very down-to-earth example, talking about uh, boiling water. There's a relatively stable arrangement of components there that give 
rise to relatively stable patterns of behavior, but there's not really any kind of strict necessity at that level. If there's a necessity, it's going to have to do with the underlying inherent intrinsic powers of the objects involved uh, to heat or to be boiled or whatever the case may be. Uh, and so the human is, is operating at a level that is uh, unscientific, really. It's, it's, it's uh, not a deep enough level of scientific analysis. On page 65, uh, Thaser talks about the three kinds of evidence that science is concerned with. There's what evidence, answering, the, answering to the question what. There's how evidence, of course, answering to the question how. And then there's that evidence. And the deficiency of empiricism is that it can only deal with that evidence. And hence, um, it has difficulty explaining even the, the flushing of a toilet. <laughs> so um, at the bottom of 65, Fraser writes in the last paragraph, second sentence, even for a simple context like the flushing of a toilet, where the powers theorists would make reference to the way the causal powers of the various component parts combine or are impeded given the circumstances and the arrangements of the parts, the human has to posit a complex network of laws connecting, say, the exact shape of this specific part, the exact shape of that specific part, the exact arrangement they happen to be in, and vibrations caused by nearby passing objects, etc., with exactly the sort of outcome that occurs in such and such particular case. So this, this makes clear the nature of the criticism, I guess. It's not so much that um, it's utterly impossible for the human to give an account of this um, operation, the flushing of a toilet, in terms of this kind of regularity between, um, you know, the conjunction of certain types of uh, events with such and such um, observable characteristics and so on. But the problem is that, especially in this context of this section, uh, that this isn't, this isn't the way science operates. That's what a philosopher like Nancy Cartwright would say, that science isn't operating in, in, this, in this sort of way. Science seems to um, operate more on the assumption of powers, and, and that suggests a way in which um, it fits better with the understanding that we have in, in the power ontology rather than the Humean empiricism. Okay, so this leads us to our first discussion question. First discussion question. Which metaphysical account of causality seems more plausible to you? The Humean observable regularity approach or the power-based approach? Humean theorists insist that our conception of causation must be grounded in empirically testable actualities, not unobserved powers. Does the Humean have a valid point here? How would the power theorist reply to this point? So that's the first discussion question. Which metaphysical account of causality seems more plausible? The Humean observable regularity approach or the power-based approach? Humeans insist that our conception of causation must be grounded in empirically testable actualities, not on unobserved powers. Does the Humean have a valid point? And how would the power theorist reply to this point? Okay, this brings us to our discussion of scientific realism. Scientific realism. In this section, uh, Faser is citing and building upon those power theorists who would argue that one virtue of the power's ontology is that it can give a better basis for scientific realism. So one question that arises is, um, why should we accept scientific realism to begin with? Well, I guess a preliminary question would be, what is scientific realism? We sort of alluded to this before, but it's basically the idea that uh, the, the entities and the laws that are mentioned in scientific theories uh, really correspond to some mind-independent reality. Okay. So we can just kind of summarize. This is roughly, we can summarize this by saying that the contents of scientific theories correspond to reality. That's what scientific realism says. And the motivation for it is given um, by Hilary Putnam, 
when he calls this the only philosophy that doesn't make the success of science a miracle. Right? So how can we account for the success of science if we deny that um, actually the contents of scientific theories actually correspond to um, a mind-independent reality? But there are problems with this. And the, the chief of these problems is that the history of science shows a pretty steady, constant change in the scientific theories. What we might describe as what the contents are. So the history of science is, it shows constant change in what the constants are. And it's also alleged that um, scientific realism can't account for how explanatory models are equally successful but incompatible. So equally successful but incompatible models. Um, and the examples he gives is, is the fact that fluids can be uh, described as both uh, particles and as a continuous medium, but obviously it can't in reality be both. So how do we account for that? I mean, you see all kinds of examples in science of there being different models that are proposed um, and they're not consistent with one another, but they seem to um, describe the data equally well and so forth. So that would be a, a, maybe a less compelling idea. So those are the, the basic um, talking points, so to speak, around scientific realism, what it is, what the motive for it is, but what the problems uh, with it are. And then you have the two uh, main forms of scientific realism. You have entity realism and structural realism. Entity realism and structural realism. So, uh, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. I guess we don't really need to define this because so entity realism would say that it's the entities posited in scientific theories that really exist, whereas structural realism says that it's the relations that, that are posited in the ma mathematical formula um, formulae of scientific theories that really exist. And of course, you could affirm both at the same time, but uh, you you know this is basically an effort to try to sort of weaken what you're claiming. Um, so it becomes more plausible to claim this. So each of these has its strengths. Entity realism seems to explain why we can manipulate, uh, for example, uh, you know, neutrons. Structural re realism relies on the aspect of theories that history suggests are most likely to survive theory change, the basic structures. So... Uh, what the power theorist wants to say is that power ontology captures the strengths of both of these forms of realism. And the reason for this is that to attribute powers to a thing is to attribute causal features to a thing and to do so precisely in terms of its relations. To attribute powers to a thing is to attribute causal features to a thing and do so precisely in terms of its relations. So the, the powers are the thing that seems like it's um, best able to explain why we can manipulate these things because we're talking about the causal relations that they actually intrinsically have um, as an entity. Uh, and it's also describing the relations that result. Uh, and so that captures the aspect of structural realism that um, the scientific realist is going to be pointing to, namely that these structures, you know, whatever else happens, seem likely to survive theory change, even if we have to recontextualize them in a different type of theory and so on. The basic relationship, um, the basic causal relationship is going to remain a, a 
stable structure. Also, power ontology relates causation laws and natural kinds in a way that makes their real existence easier to defend. Because to attribute powers to a thing scientifically is to attribute to it certain causal properties, typical of the kind to which it belongs. And laws of nature can be understood as descriptions of behavioral regularities that follow upon the manifestation of a causal power a thing has by virtue of being the kind of thing it is. Uh, okay, so that's what Phaser basically is describing on um, page 67. And finally, um, power ontology can answer the objection that realism cannot account for how explanatory models that are equally successful but incompatible can apply to the same systems. It says that because powers manifest themselves in different ways, in different circumstances, it's sometimes useful to model their manifestations in one way and sometimes useful to model their manifestations in another way. Um, so, you know, the powers are the powers. That's the realistic aspect. But the modeling uh, can be, you know, both equally good ways of capturing the powers depending upon the circumstances. That's the idea. So this leads to our second discussion question, which is, is scientific realism correct? Is scientific realism correct? Is Putnam right that if it's not correct, then the success of science is a miracle? Is a powers ontology necessary to defend scientific realism? So is scientific realism correct? Is Putnam right that if it's not correct, the success of science therefore is a miracle? And is a powers ontology necessary to defend scientific realism? Now, powers and laws of nature. So we saw at the beginning of this video that the notion of laws of nature originated in a theological context, namely occasionalism, as God's decrees. And so the question naturally arises, can such laws be made sense of apart from God? What is a law of nature if it's not a divine decree? For an empiricist, a law of nature is a regularity found in nature. But Phaser has an important objection to this. He says, if a law is just a regularity, then it doesn't explain anything. If a law is just a regularity, it doesn't explain anything. Calling regular patterns of natural behavior laws merely redescribes them rather than explaining them. And note, note the difference here between this sort of uh, theological idea. You know, to say that, you know, why is it that um, water boils? I mean, as a, silly as it may sound to say that, well, that's because of what God wills. It is a kind of explanation um, for why water boils would put over a flame, right? But if you just, if you just point to the regularity, hey, every time I put water over a flame, it, it boils, um, you, you're just describing um, something that happens. You're not explaining it. That's, that's the basic idea. You might challenge that, but that's his basic idea. So he says we need to know why some regularities exist in nature rather than other regularities, or none at all. And by contrast, then, the power theorists can say, well, these regularities obtain because they're pleiotropic or vector-like manifestations of powers that things have in virtue of their essences. So it's possible for there to be a kind of metaphysical explanation. It's not theological, of course. <coughs> Okay, there are a couple other options uh, appealing to universals, so I'm just going to uh, skip over those. Um, Armstrong, the metaphysician Armstrong's uh, semi-human gnomic necessitation view. Um, so, long story short, uh, in this section, Phaser tries to show that there really isn't a good account of laws of nature other than the power ontology. Um, power theorist's account of natural laws says that a law is a matter of a natural kind having a certain essential property, and a causal law is a matter of a natural kinds having a certain dispositional capacity or causal power. So essentially, laws are ways of talking about the behavior that regularly results um, when 
we have things that possess certain powers. So power is the more metaphysically fundamental level, not laws. Whereas the regularity theorist is going to say regularity is basic, and and they have difficulty in, in distinguishing between regularities and, and laws, um, especially in accounting for any kind of necessity. It's going to end up supposing that this is just the contingent regularity. That's essentially the idea. So this leads to the third discussion question. Can there be laws of nature without God? Without the possibility of laws of nature being divine decrees, what else could they be? What are the consequences of getting rid of the concept of a law of nature? So third discussion question, can there be laws of nature without God? Without the possibility of laws of nature being divine decrees, what else could they be? And what are the consequences of getting rid of the concept of a law of nature? So, um, once again, I've fallen short of running a little bit behind of what I wanted to, to do in these first two videos because we haven't yet covered the third section of chapter one on real distinctions. Um, so, the real distinction between act and potency and between a substance and its power and how that relates to the uh, distinction in contemporary analytic metaphysics between categorical and dispositional properties. So, um, we'll begin that in the next video.